There's no man that did anything of scale and meaning by himself. I think only after those innovators and rule breakers succeed do we celebrate them. Life is a giving competition and we intend to win. That's a really good one. I want you to unpack that because most of us live in a scarcity mindset and and yet uh, we are designed to be altruistic. And many of you who are listening may not know this, but you know, we talk, I always talk about sugar and the, the biological addiction of sugar and obviously heroin and cocaine and drugs. Mm -hmm. we, we know all about this, this sort of pathway of dopamine and addiction and these substances. But what's also true is that altruism and giving lights up the same area of the brain as heroin or cocaine or sugar, and it's a lot healthier for you. And the side effects are all good ones. So talk about this whole idea of, of winning at the game of giving. Because that is that's a it's not typically how our society is structured or how we think. It's all about individualism. It's all about every man for himself. It's all about getting what you can at the end of the day. The guy with the most toys wins. It's all this stuff that we have in our culture yeah. is so destructive. And yet you're yeah. putting it upside down and creating a new model for how to think about being together in the world. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the quote, you, uh, you, I think you said it was George Oliver. It's the unreasonable man. George Bernard Shaw, yeah. Jo I'm sorry, George Bernard Shaw. Uh, it's the unreasonable men and women. If there's no man that did anything of scale and meaning by himself. That's a total made-up construct. Um, so, you know, starting with the idea that like, you know, the, in the Hagakure, um, one of the, the philosophy books of the samurai, it talks about how relying on one man's knowledge is like a tree without roots. Um, and so the idea that, you know, you can get deeply passionate about a topic. So a conversation with anyone in that field is pleasurable. Um, and then you can really just ask questions and build your own expertise in every aspect of your life. I think um, I, I was lucky enough to spend a little time with Hicks and Gracie, who is you know, the, one of the grand masters of the Gracie jiu-jitsu family, Brazilian jiu-jitsu family. Mm -hmm. He wrote a great book called Breathe. It's just all about his breathing practice and how he would you know, uh, maintain a lower heart rate through these, you know, these world title fights. Um, and and the, the way that he you know, put it, the way that he talked about a few of these things that I thought were really you know, powerful and beautiful. First, I'll just tell you, like he would do these deep breathing exercises before he would go out for a fight and he would think about lowering his heart rate. And so when he was at, you know, 80 beats per minute, his opponent was at 90. When he was at 100, wow. they were at 110. Um, wow. And he he could always keep a cool head. And then, you know, uh, submission fighting, you're, you know, in something that you can't break out of unless you remember the process. It's like chess. You have to like calm your mind, surrender to where you're stuck and have sort of the hope for where you're going and what you're going to go and do and build. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, for, for, for us, that made us really like fun people to talk to. We're 23. We're somehow in your office. We got on your calendar. You don't want to take the meeting. This is like 2009 or something. And then you're having the most fun conversation you've had all week. You know, like we, we, we then built real pattern recognition over time where we could really add value for these people. We could really, you know, connect them um, into, you know, strategically valuable business ideas or relationships. And then, you know, we also could pattern match people that would just be great friends. So this is not just at Summit events. This is throughout the year. And it yeah. would sort of validate the reality that Summit was this place, this platform, this community that, you know, you could connect to and meet these people from all these different disciplines and backgrounds. Um, and so if I'm being honest, I used to be in a reciprocity loop. I knew the power of my giving. I knew what it was for our brand. Um, and, and people, even if they're aware that, you know, you're looking for reciprocity, they still feel obligated for the most part to, to actualize it. And I think that, you know, it, it came later in, in, our, in my career, this idea that life is a giving competition. You know, if you're counting chips, you're in a reciprocity loop, you're in a game of trades, yeah. you yeah. have an ulterior motive for your kindness. And so it also takes some of the serotonin and dopamine out of it. It's not nearly as enjoyable than, than to just, and think about how lucky you are to get to be a part of somebody's journey who you respect and admire. Mm. There was a time yeah. where everybody who's somebody was a nobody. And, you know, that, that, that just the idea alone that you can, you know, provide insight or value to be a part of somebody's, you know, body of work or life journey. It's just, it's very meaningful to me personally. Um, and, and, you know, this idea that if you are a giver, you're always going to be on the heavier side of the giving in the relationship. The mm. other person might not have the same 
dopamine serotonin, serotonin pathway or reaction to giving unselfishly. Um, but you know, it does lead to this triangulation of goodwill. That was the language we would use. It's like, you know, mm. you don't have to think about it as a one-to-one giving. Um, because if you build a reputation, if you, you know, build enough favor economy surplus, anybody will do you a favor. You put mm. yourself in a mindset where why mm. wouldn't you ask for the favor? I'm going to give Mark the gift of giving me a gift by hosting me on the podcast, right? Like, yeah. I don't want to deny you this pleasure, Mark. Um, All right. So, you know, <laughs> You know, so I think that I left the, you know, gifts that don't circulate become poison. You know, gifts mm. that have an expectation of some return are not really a gift. It's an investment in yourself, right? It's a selfish act. You know, masquerading mm. is a selfless act. So, you know, if you do sit in giving competition and you do think that, all right, I am going to make sure that I'm on the upside of the uh, generosity of this relationship. I don't know. You always have some love. There's always a seat for you. It doesn't work like that. Yeah, no, it doesn't work like that. I, it's so amazing. And I I, uh, I see this act out all the time in my life because I, I, I'm blessed to be able to sort of be generous with my time and my money. And and I just am compelled always to give and serve. It's really what I want to do. And, and then I kind of giggle because it all comes back to me in ways that I never imagined that aren't in direct one-to-one relationship, but kind of sideways that I was like, wow, I, I feel so blessed. But I think it is just this sort of magic power of, of serving. And, and you know, sort of like what uh, Neem Karoli Baba said, who is Ram Dawson's um, guru, uh, who basically said, love everybody, serve everybody, feed everybody, which is pretty much what you guys are doing. <laughs> and it's, it just, it creates this beautiful circle of, of, um, of abundance and, Mm-hmm. And it's, it's hard for people to get out of the scarcity mindset into an abundance mindset. But we're in this moment in, in history where things are kind of blowing up. Uh, we're seeing amazing strife in the world, conflict, uh, divisiveness in our society in America. It's you know red and blue, and it's just so it's so scary to me compared to you know what the world used to seem like to me, which is you know more of a safe place and the rise of autocracy, climate change, um, you know the increasing wealth and disparities, the health disparities. Uh, so many challenges we're facing and, and we need big ideas. We need, we need different kinds of thinking and different kinds of, of dreams to actually solve these problems. And it's really what your book is about. It's about inspiring people to think differently, to dream big and to build community. And it, it sort of reminds me of a Margaret Mead quote, uh, which I think many, many people know, which is uh, never doubt that a small group of committed people can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. And clearly that's the case with you and your three buddies. <laughs> so, so Jeff, as people are, are kind of in this moment of post-COVID or maybe we're in the sort of tail end of COVID, you know, we're, we're sort of reimagining our lives. Um, and, and many people are sort of thinking, what do I want to do now? How do I want my life to be different? I don't want to go back to normal because normal wasn't fun. Uh, and, and people are quitting their jobs to pursue their dreams or they're told maybe that their ideas aren't great or they don't work or timing is not good or they're crazy. I've certainly been told. That. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and yet, you know, that, that sort of people, you know, it's like, it's like that it reminds me of the ad from uh, Steve Jobs about, you know, uh, you know, people who just think differently, right. Think differently. And, mm-hmm. and, and you gather people who think differently and a lot of the people who've made a difference in the world, the greatest achievers, including you and your crew, um, have really made a huge impact. So um, what, what made Summit possible and, and how did it come to life and how, and how has it transformed in ways that actually are fulfilling on the dreams that you and your three co-founders had to create a new world where mm-hmm. we can reimagine solving the world's problems, being a community, and, and actually creating a, a better life for all of us? Thank you so much, Mark. And thank you again for having me on the podcast. I'll start by saying there's two types of entrepreneurs. And uh, if you're high functioning and you're afflicted by ambition, if you have to go out and build, you have to create <laughs> art, you have to make music, you have to change medicine, you have, if, you're, if you have to push, there's two types yeah. of people in that category. There are those that are just absolute geniuses. These are like the 0.1%. And they can sign every check and hire every person and, you know, do it all themselves. And then there's the vast, vast majority, the rest of us that really do require a lot of other brilliant people around us to do anything of scale and meaning. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's certainly myself and my group. I think we also, you know, 
are voracious interdisciplinary learners as, as just a cohort of, you know, co-founders. We are um, insatiably curious about all of these different disciplines and we see how they're all connected, our health and our wealth, our friendships and our businesses. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think that inconsistencies in one typically raise up in the others over time. Um, and the the value of community um, and and the idea of big ideas. I think the world is set up to shut down big ideas. That's what mm. it's supposed to do. Your rational friend is supposed to say that's a crazy idea, Mark. Just go back to <laughs> you know doing what you were doing. Um, and I think only after those innovators and rule breakers succeed, the Steve Jobs of the world, do we celebrate them. They're heretics until. Um, they've been proven correct in a sense, right? So having exactly. people around you that are entrepreneurial, that are creative, that are non-judgmental, that enjoy crazy ideas and enjoy the art of batting them around, it's really ingenuity. It's like, how are we going to take this thing and, and bring it to a place where it's actually uh, near possible? Yeah. It's so beautiful. It sort of reminds me of the, the quote from George Bernard Shaw. He said, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. And you guys were pretty unreasonable. <laughs> you guys like, we want to do something radically crazy. And we have no f- connections. We have no money. We mm-hmm. don't know what we're doing. The two of you didn't even have a college degree. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you kind of like dropped out. And you've created one of the most remarkable organizations that I've ever experienced, which gathers people and and creates magic in the stew of the gathering uh and, and yeah. it sort of remind when you were talking it reminded me of this book i read that really influenced me years ago by eo wilson called the unity of knowledge consilience the unity of knowledge mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and it's about the intersectionality of all disciplines that that both social sciences and and um regular science are are not that different and that we can kind of learn from this intersectionality how to actually synthesize new ways of thinking and being and creating and reimagining the world, which we desperately need now. Um, yeah. so, so let's sort of jump into like uh, you know, sort of some of the sort of uh, things that, that, that Summit is about, and then we'll talk more about the book. But the you know the thing that struck me there is is just the the, the, the radical diversity of people I'll see on stage. You know, uh, I remember seeing I think Jane Goodall with like Kobe Bryant or something. I don't know. It was like I was like I don't know who was on stage, but it was like these weird collections of people that you wouldn't otherwise see together talking about the world in new ways that are super inspiring. And, and uh, so talk about some of the kinds of people that have been there, what you've learned from them, um, you know, and what are the sort of, what are the things that have really stuck with you as lessons that you've carried through through Summit and some of your co-founders have? We've had 3,000 talks over 14 years wow. across our large and small events and, and like, you know, uh, I think something like 600 or 700 performances and poets and dancers. And, mm. um, you know, I think that first I'll say in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man's king, you know, like, I don't know that we're absolute <laughs> superstars at content, but there's just not many conferences out there. So there's not that many yeah. examples that you get to play from. And for us, um, we really like to shave down the pedestal when it comes to content. We, we prefer the fireside chat to the TED talk. I want to know mm-hmm. what inspires mm-hmm. you. I want to know what you're enthused by. I want to know what you shouldn't tell us, not what you thought six months ago that we would be interested mm-hmm. in. I want to know what you were like, I'm not going to say this thing on stage. That, that's mm-hmm. what I'm looking for. Um, yeah. And I think that, you know, when, when you approach um, a interdisciplinary, intergenerational community, you just have to represent a lot of interests. Um, and the way that we really do that is that like, we're sensitive to our favorite rappers, favorite rappers, be it in medicine or in architecture or in music or in business. Um, so somebody that we're close with that's brilliant, like you, for instance, um, you know, I want to know who the doctors are and the, in the, um, you know, the, the practitioners around the world that you would be incredibly excited to see at summit. So if I have, you know, 20 people like you who are at the top of their field, in 20 different disciplines and you tell me the two or three people that you would like, you know, tear your ACL sprinting to a summit event to get to see <laughs> live. That's, that's yeah. really how we've done it over the years. And that's how we, you know, that's how we set and scope um, whom we have on stage. And so to pick one person in particular, in terms of like wisdom that we got to take away from this, it's just impossible. 
Um, and you know, I, what I can say is we were 23, 24 years old when we started this. So we were immediately the youngest, least experienced people in the entire community. And so it made us real servant leaders. It really did. It made us really, you know, um, value critique and criticism from people that wanted to see you when silence is when you know you lost them. If they're telling you how you're screwing up, that means they care about you and they want to see it be yeah. better because they appreciate what you do. Um, yeah. So, so I think, you know, for uh, it's just like this learning engine, this, you know, learning safari we've gotten to go on for the past, you know, decade and a half. Yeah. And in, in the book, you beautifully sort of map out a lot of the lessons learned and a lot of the little nuggets of wisdom. I just, I sort of want to read a few of the, the headings of the chapters because they're just sort of great. I mean, some of them are things we've heard before, like your reach should always exceed your grasp. Um, ready, fire, aim. That's kind of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of me sometimes <laughs> like you just yeah. gotta go for it um authenticity trumps perfection uh uh if you want to go fast go alone if you want to go far go together that's an african proverb and i think community is exactly what you're building and creating which we need more than ever uh opportunities come from anywhere a single connection can be exponential you talk about the mindset of possibility and how you had to face a lot of rejection i mean here you are three young guys you're calling you know leaders of companies jeff bezos jane goodall this one that was like al gore and they're like like who are you and what do you want and like how do you get to them and it always amazed me how you collected some of the most extraordinary people in the world to come to your events and speak and how, how did that happen because it just it just seems so improbable um yeah man I, again i think that most of these events around the world are really boring and really stodgy and it's like watching paint dry and it's yeah. all symposium stage. It's all, you know, mm. keynote from the stage, maybe some coffee outside, but for the most part, it's, it's very basic. Um, and so the amount of events that these great people that you mentioned get to go to around the world that they truly enjoy, where they meet other peers, where they get exposed to new ideas, where, you know, we, we have a rule at Summit, don't snub the startup and don't fanboy the big timer. Um, you know, yeah. so like yeah. both people have to respect each other, both sides of that, that spectrum. Um, and we are also very thoughtful about timing. Um, yeah. and we, we do our research. I always think it's funny when like you're on the phone with somebody or on a zoom and you're like, Oh, so tell me about this thing that you did. They're like, how do you know that? It's like, cause I Googled you five minutes before our call. <laughs> I don't understand how you don't know how I did this. Right. So we, we don't just say like, Hey, come speak at our event and then let's figure out what it is later. We say, Hey, this is what we want you to talk about because it aligns with what we've seen you talk about. We know that this book is coming out or this movie is coming out or this partnership is happening or something came out in the news that you probably want to have a counterpoint or another type of like presence to, right? So, or the really thoughtful and fun connection. So like, yeah, to, one great example is uh, Kendrick Lamar and Quentin Tarantino, you know, um, we, we had gotten lucky enough to become friends with like the TDE crew. They had come out and skied at Powder Mountain. I think Kendrick might have learned how to snowboard at Powder Mountain. Um, pretty sure. And, uh, and, and he has a, a friend and a partner named Dave Free, who's an incredible entrepreneur and director and creative and was the president of, uh, of, of TV at the time. Um, and, and, you know, they were like very much being kind to us and not just saying no outright. Cause it's like, you know, a million plus a show for anything for, the, for, you know, Kendrick to show up anywhere, let alone like flying across the country. This is for summit at sea. So it's like leave LA, fly across the country, get on another plane, get on this boat, be on the boat for three and a half days. It's like an obscene commitment. And so yeah. I think they were just trying to, you know, be nice and let us go. It was like, yeah, we're in if you get Quentin Tarantino. Ah, <laughs> like, like, and you what did. They do, it, well, that's the thing. They didn't know that we have other, like, it, once you're in this sort of, you know, 10 year community building um, business, you come across other exceptional people that appreciate this blend. And so, mm -hmm. um, one of his producers, uh, a woman named Stacey Cher, who's another incredible entrepreneur and creative in person, and her husband, Carrie Brown, were neighbors at Powder Mountain. And um, mm -hmm. Chris Blackwell, the founder of Island Records, actually contributed to this scheme for us to get this done. Um, wow. He has uh, these beautiful hotels in Jamaica, and I, I was like, "Hey, if, if, if you know Tarantino and, and you know the TDE group, they they want to come to Jamaica and stay at 
Island Outpost at GoldenEye, which you host them. He's like, oh, of yeah. course, it would be my pleasure. So it's all mutually beneficial. Nobody's losing here. And it turned yeah. out that Quentin and Kendrick both deeply respect each other's work. So I just wanted to give the listeners like a true window into how an event hustler puts all these people together. Yeah. I think this is how you like produce movies with a bunch of big stars too. You just gotta yeah. like, you know, find the thing that everybody is really seeking and make that the priority of the vehicle. I love that. I love that. But it wasn't always easy, right? It was, you had a lot of roadblocks, roadblocks and you kind of had a lot of bumps along the road. Um, tell us about some of the biggest things that you overcame in order to succeed at what you're doing. Well, it's never easy. Like even the ones where it's just like, oh, shucks, I minted this NFT and now I'm a millionaire. Like <laughs> those stories are there just to make us all feel like we don't have enough. Um, the yeah. truth is, is that is that everything is a lot of hard work and you can't minor in anything. Uh, and so, you know, for us, our own naivete uh, led to us taking shots like buying Powder Mountain or, you know, building, you know, thousand person camping trips in the forest or you know, these other big crazy moves. But it also meant that we had to get our teeth knocked out on like the growth of our business over time. So, you know, whether it was retaining great people um, and dealing with, you know, having to replace a tremendous partner or, or, you know, team member, or it's like learning about, you know, municipal bonds and, uh, and project level finance and, you know, infrastructure development. Um, I think that's probably the best story to go in on just because it's so I obscene. mean, seriously, so, like four, yeah. four young 20 somethings bought a village, basically a right, town so, and so, a mountain. So like, before, before, yeah. So before we buy it, it's like 2012, and this is in the book, but we, uh, we're at Summit Base Camp. We're hosting like an 800-person event in Squaw Valley, amazing speakers, you know, like mm. there's, you know, talks with the founder of Burning Man, and then you're mm. taking the gondola up the mountain to see Questlove DJ on top of the hill. Mm. And there's like long throw summit logos that we have on the sides of mountains. And it was just like, you know, uh, and it was a great event. We did well. And uh, there were about 50 people who were just like, Hey, uh, tomorrow morning when the event's over, meet us behind the hotel and, you know, bring all your stuff. And so we put them all on a bus and we took them all to the airport and they went to an unmarked gate, like some Harry Potter. Shit. And it was just, you know, unmarked <laughs> gate. nobody knew, nobody knew where we were going. Um, and we flew them all to Salt Lake, or I think Ogden, Utah. And then we went to Powder Mountain and we watched the mm. sunset on the top of Powder Mountain, which is, oh. you know, Powder Mountain's crazy because it's an inverted topography. So you drive to the top and you ski off our village. Our new, our yeah. village now is on the top of the mountain and it looks over yeah. the great Salt Lake and four States in every direction. And just, mm. it's, it's gorgeous. Um, and from that moment for the next two years, we, we were in the process of both buying the mountain. So we didn't actually own it yet. We had put down earnest money to lock up the contract, but we had to raise, you know, like 40 million plus dollars. Um, and, and we had to, and we had to learn what we didn't know. So we could actually diligence the deal far enough to, to, you weren't real estate developers. You were just young yes. kids with a crazy dream. So, well, well, even if you are a real estate developer, you need to run like a 160 point due diligence checklist against the project and property, the warrants, the rights, the water yeah. rights, the land rights, the, you know, the, the avalanche control. That's just like so crazy. There's so much stuff. Um, and so what we would do is every week we would host what are called charrettes. So we would have like a land planning charrette, an architecture charrette, a design charrette. And we would have experts come in, consultants, architects, thought leaders, whatever. Some you'd retain and you'd work with for a long period of time. Others would just like advise you and walk the land, do the pro So we're getting like a doctorate in land planning and development. And every weekend we would bring in another group of like 200 people. And, and at first it was for free, but we just knew we needed to build the vibe and the body heat. Um, out in Eden, Utah, in order to like build enough energy and capital to close on this project. And we literally did that for like a year and a half. I think we hosted like 60 plus weekends in a row. And then every wow. week we would have these experts come out and work with us. And we would raise the money while building the team, while hosting the people, while learning about how to develop a mountain. And so you um, built the plane while you were flying yeah. it, basically. <laughs> well, and, and there's just no, that's not a wise way to do things. Wisdom means that you have like time and reflection and a plan and the strategy that you're executing against. This is just like full gonzo blues brothers mania. And, um, mm. you know, the truth is that we're lucky that we made it out the other side. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it. 
Yeah. It <laughs> sounds like a lot of bruises, but you got through it. And, uh, and yeah. you know, a lot of my friends and people have places there, go there. I've been there. It's just, it's just a beautiful spot and it's just an incredible way for people to meet and gather, inspire each other and create this sort of intersectionality that is, it's so important to sort of reimagining the world we're in. Uh, and, and it's also fun. So it's like, you know, you, you sort of create a container where people can, learn and be exposed to ideas and be inspired and think about challenging things in life, both personal and political and social, environmental, financial. And, and yet at the same time, it's like fun, right? So most, yeah. like you said, most conferences are pretty freaking boring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you want to snooze in the back. What, what, how do you kind of bring fun into all this? Cause it's not easy to do. Uh, well, first it's through the people that join, you know, if you're curious and you're, you know, um, interested in others. And if you, you know, are, are, are if you, it's really self-selecting in a sense, right? Like I tell you, it's intergenerational and interdisciplinary and super social and choose your own adventure and, you know, if there's plenty of people who are like, yeah, no, no, thanks. It's not for me. So I think um, out the gate, you know, you, you, there's a self-selection. Um, and then we have this term, the art of social sculpture. It's one mm. of the chapters in the book. And the yeah. idea is that, um, you know, the narrative and the rituals and then the order of the experience and your smells and tastes and touches, and there's just a thousand touch points that inform the values of what you just went through. Um, and so for us, it literally starts with the invite. Like, how do you hear about it? Who do you meet on my team to tell you about it? What is like the graphic design of the website that you go to for the very first time? You know, all that's, that's when the event begins. So what's the provocation? Why are we coming together? Um, and then we think about the order of experiences. Like it, it applies to roads as it does events, as, and as, as it does to movies and music. But, you know, you want to have a build and a drop. You want to have a grand reveal. You know, there it's these these there are the, there is intersectionality not just to wisdom but to to creation to experience right so um, you know w we often have dance classes and meditation we have you know live music we'll have you know um, a beautiful pianist play something that's you know totally passive and then we'll have like a big you know deep house dance party at sunrise right like we we um, mm -hmm. you know are always and I guess the key is that in you know fun, dynamic, shared experiences, that is the cornerstone of long-term, deeply meaningful relationships. We're going to hang on this podcast. We're going to become better friends. We spend a little time together. But if we went and robbed a bank today, I guarantee you we'd be <laughs> lifelong friends. Man. I don't want to do that. We, I don't want to do that. I think the better things like... <laughs> okay, jump out of an airplane or like okay, you know, I'll do go that. on a, go on a wild adventure, you know, go off a waterfall in a kayak yeah. or just or, or do a holotropic breathing exercise for the first time. Yeah. Or, you know, see a talk that's super interesting and inspiring and about something that, you know, you don't often get to chop it up with people you don't know who are also interested and introspective about, right? So that 20 minutes or 30 minutes after a talk, we always protect that. We don't really like to do one after the other after the other as yeah. many other conferences yeah. do. Um, so, so, you know, that, that's our KPI. Our KPI is, you know, the, the relationships. That's a key our, performance uh, indicator for those that's listening. That's right. Sorry. Know that is. <laughs> My bad. Uh, the, the number one metric that we're tracking is like, how do we, how do we define our success is really like, you know, what relationships people leave our events with. And if you're overt with that and you're like, okay, let's network or, you know, like we're going to do handshake time and everybody tell each other about like, get your name tag. It's like, that's not what this yeah, is. No. It's, it's pattern recognition from seeing the same people pop up, choosing the same things that you've chosen throughout an event experience and having it be casual and feel good um, and not be forced and overt um, that, that yeah. I think leads to the fun. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I want to share a story because I, I had a, an amazing experience at Summit in LA a few years ago where I ran into a guy online getting into a restaurant that, that was sort of allocated for Summit. And, you know, you don't know who you're going to sit next to or who's going to join you. And, and uh, you know, this guy admittedly said, look, you're somebody I never would have wanted to hang out with or sit with or have dinner with. <laughs> I was like, okay, fine. And <laughs> we ended up at this table together. Uh, and it was Rylan Englehart, who's become a dear friend. And and he started talking to me about soil and his passion about soil as a solution for some of what, what's wrong with the world, climate change, environmental degradation, our food problems. And he 
basically was the founder of uh, Cafe Gratitude, which was a vegan cafe, but went to New Zealand and heard a talk about soil and realized that we need to integrate animals and then built an regenerative farm with his family and started Kiss the Ground, a nonprofit that's about changing how we think about soil and, and changing policy and farmers and educating farmers. And it's this beautiful organization. And he started telling me about it in the, this book, Kiss the Ground, that was written and the move became a movie, which I was in. And, and, and we have literally become so close and have helped each other expand what we're doing. And I, I because of that meeting, I really got aware more deeply about the importance of soil and health and how we can't as a, i can't as a doctor treat my patients without also going to deal with the problems of agriculture and how food is grown and what's grown and that led to me writing the book food fix and that led to me creating a nonprofit called food fix to change food policy which you've raised five million dollars for and we're doing more and it's led to a documentary that's coming out on, on like all this stuff that like never would have happened if i hadn't had this random collision with a guy who i never otherwise would have met in this beautiful fun way and that's just one example and i i imagine there's a thousand of those stories or thousands of those stories over the years that you probably heard and 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 that's just one um well, and, well and i'm it, curious mark why did you say yes to summit because you get paid to speak around the world and we you know we we were asking you to do you know what you're compensated for you know well yeah. for free yeah. right how like, do you suck you people did, in to talk for free is that what yeah, you're yeah yeah <laughs> well because you asked you asked me and now you're talking about this amazing connection that you felt you formed there which is just the best it's like the greatest thing to hear and i'm curious like why did you say yes to this how did you end up there i i think you know the 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 notion that i understood about summit was that it was a place for people who care deeply about the world and about their own personal development and growth about making the world a better place uh, and about building community and and for me that's really at the heart of my life is is how do how do we create a better world for all of us how do we build community how do we actually learn from people who are not in our fields and how do we start to create sort of a different way of showing up together. You know, and I can go to medical conferences and I can hang out with other doctors and I can go to, mm -hmm. you know, I can go to Milken Conference and it's kind of a very stuffy environment. And I hear about different things, but it's it's kind of like a stuffed shirt environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and some of it just feels like a giant, like gathering of fun, interesting people who are doing cool stuff. And, and I just wanted to be part of it. I wanted to meet people who were also leaning into life, who were making no small plans, who were thinking big, who were chasing their dreams, who were building community, all the taglines of your book, the name of your book, exactly, that's exactly why I want to go and why, I mean, <laughs> I literally, to go to, to go to the summit in Palm Springs in November, I'm going to be flying all the way from Japan to come back for oh that my God. because that's how much I care about having the chance to be in the soup of these incredibly interesting, creative humans who mm -hmm. are reimagining the world together. And, and, and I would pay to go to that. You know, it's like, I don't need to be paid. Yeah. And it's, so it's, it's really, and it's, I think why a lot of people are drawn. I built some of my closest friendships and community from that, from that world. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I get asked to speak all the time and I often will say no, but I feel that this is really a sort of a very different kind of community. And I'm also sort of want to dive into community because it's, it's sort of the third pillar of make no small plans, which is building community. And, and I, I've spent a lot of the last 10 years of my life, particularly after I went to Haiti and I worked with Paul Farmer and really understood mm -hmm. what he did to change healthcare in Haiti and around the world uh, using the power of community. He called it accompaniment. We accompany each other to health. Mm -hmm. And I use that framework to address chronic disease. He was addressing TB and AIDS through building community health workers and networks of people to help each other that were just neighbors, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I began to learn about how we call non-communicable disease is actually very communicable. <laughs> Chronic yeah. disease, heart disease, diabetes, all these things. And, and so I worked with Rick Warren to build the Daniel Plan, a faith-based wellness community where we got a quarter million people. I mean, I have 15,000 people, so those are a quarter million pounds. I've, I've translated that into a secular version at Cleveland Clinic where we've created a group model of care that has, mm -hmm. you know, threefold better outcomes and one-on-one -on -one doctor visits. And I, it's really central to my life is this notion of community. And I, I think it's really part of what you're trying to teach and build and create. So tell, tell us sort of, in, from your perspective, like why is community important? 
well, how do we build it for ourselves and 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 um and why does it matter yeah the the greatest thing that we can give to someone else is to include them in our community to introduce mm-hmm. them to our parents and our best friends you know to to spend time that's the thing that you know is most priceless and you don't know how much of it you get and you can't get it back and it's set like you can't you can't expand or contract it right now i don't want to get into a mm-hmm. like a like a, a, a deeply philosophical debate because i'm not even sure if i agree with my own statement there if we really start talking <laughs> about how time feels and how we use it but um the greatest punishment that we have is to take away people's time and to separate them from our communities and send them off you know to prison um you know we used to exile people you know hundreds of years ago that's the greatest punishment so the idea that you know um, people to share this life with, um, it's hardwired in us. I mean, I don't think it's worth debating. You know, like this is innate. This is like, why do we breathe? Why do we eat? It's it's it, yeah. we need it. And um, you know, when when couples who've been together for a long time and one of them dies, um, you don't just lose your partner. You actually lose a large portion of your shared memory, right? Like mm-hmm. you have some experience of a, of a experience, your, your partner or your friend or the person that you're with has another experience of that situation. Mm. So, so those people are more than just the people around you. They're actually part of you. They are part of your memory and some of your memory sits in them. Um, and I think that this idea that like our liberation is bound up together, the things that we want, like the way to get them is together. You know, like it's this Mm -hmm. idea that one plus one can equal three. Um, and I think it's hard to practice. It's hard to not get, you know, jealous and not feel included when like your friends are, you know, crushing it or doing something or having fun or creating without you. You want to be a part of it all once you're in it. Mm-hmm. Right. So, um, I think that, you know, like when it comes to the thing that I value the most above all else is the community. It's the people that I spend yeah. time with. Um, and, you know, I love the quote, you are the average of the five people that you spend the most time around. Mm-hmm. Right. Like you're, you're helping create the values that the small group shares that is the mm-hmm. thing that everybody is actualizing, right? So if we're all into mm-hmm. video games, we're all going to be getting better at video games. If we're all into health and wellness, we're all going to be competing in a sense and sharing and sharpening our sword on one another and whatever is the thing or things that our group really, you know, um, celebrates. Uh, so I think it's really important to choose wisely the people that you're around and to, to aim high. You know, like yeah. I, min, min, mentors, it's a, I, have a, I have a mentor that um, said to me once, it's like, hey, man, if you are just going to tell me that everything's cool and good and we're just kicking it here, not very fun for me. I got plenty of friends. I don't need another friend. Yeah. If you're willing to tell me the things that you actually need help with and we yeah. can chop it up and I can be, you know, I can use my wisdom that I've learned over the extra 30 years I have on you. That's really fun. Mm-hmm. So you have yeah. to like be willing to share and give and be vulnerable and build intimacy and build trust. And that, you know, again, another book chapter is, you know, there's no better building block than trust. And that's what it's all about. It's yeah. like, once we trust each other, we can really help each other. And until then, it's it's almost extractive. It's always at arm's length. So for people listening, you know, you, you've done such a good job of building community. How, how do you advise people to start to build and nurture these relationships and, and, and connect with people in a way that actually matters? And, you know, I, I say this because we don't really have that in our culture. It's really every man for himself. It's mm-hmm. rugged individualism. And, you know, I'm writing a book on longevity now called Young Forever. And, mm-hmm. and you know, a lot of the blue zones where people look to be well over 100, it's, it's because they have such a beautiful community. I've been to Sardinia. I've been mm-hmm. to Loma Linda. I've been to Costa Rica. I'm going mm-hmm. to Ikaria soon. And and I think that, you know, the central feature of these cultures is that, that they're just connected to each other throughout life. And in Okinawa, yeah. they have something called a Moai, which is a group of four or five people that you're kind of thrown together with as babies that you live your whole life with that are your little yeah. core group. Um, so how do we get there in a world that's so divided and we're so isolated and we live in little nuclear or disrupted families? Uh, how mm-hmm. do we get there? I would start by saying that uh, we often think of ourselves as what we're into, not what we do. Like we, mm. we like to judge ourselves by our interests, not our actions. And so mm. I think what you do is a better measure of who you are. Like how do you actualize the things that you say that you're into? 
And it's so hard, especially when it's like against your, 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 you know, brain, like not eating sugar, you know, after a meal or whatever, when you have the cake in front of you, that kind of thing. Um, and when it comes to community, when it comes to friendship, you know, like you you need to actually, uh, uh, do the thing. So you said, you know, like the best way to be invited to the party is to host the party. Well, that's exactly right. And every community, um, has someone that makes it their charge um, to gather and organize that community to bring people together. Um, and so that's the first step. And then I think that part of the work is on yourself. Like if you want to build community in any space, if you want to have friends that have certain traits or that, um, or expertise or interests, you have to be interesting in that space. So like, you know, for, for you, um, I think that, if I had literally just no interest whatsoever in the things that you do and are passionate about, it would probably be an odd friendship and vice versa, right? It would just be like, okay, nice enough guy, but like, I'm not going to become friends. I'm not going to start spending time together and hanging out. But if I, you know, like I imagine you talk to people who, who, you know, are huge fans of your work and have read every one of your books, but they don't, they're not coming up with questions to the, the ideas, the big ideas. If, if, uh, so for me, you know, if you're saying like, how did this start? Like, how do we begin? It's not about how we maintain relationships now. Um, uh, it's how to like, when you're, when you have, you know, a couple friends, you're not in a particular field, you don't have cool, you know, the cool people around you who can help you build and grow your life. Um, you know, I love that the word enthusiasm, the root is in theos. It means with God, yeah. right? Yeah. And if you yeah. can find your enthusiasm and you can learn in enthusiasm, then it's not work. And then you can become great at something. Then you can become knowledgeable at something. And start collecting the questions that you have. And then ask your stupid questions to really knowledgeable people when you get the opportunity. Yeah. And it's fun for them. That's it. Yeah. That's the whole ball yeah. game. Now you're a fun yeah. friend. Now you're interesting to talk to. And then you take yeah. that next step, which is like, you know, all, uh, you can't take it personally. People are busy. But if I ask you, you know, five times to go, and do something interesting, whether it's a, a small gathering with other people or go for a hike or do whatever. It's just, again, like, uh, I, I guess I'll end with this to this particular uh, question. Uh, there's a, there's a, we talk about it in the book, there's a guy named Michael Hebb, who's a dear friend of ours, who's like, you know, yeah. the artist around the table. He, he's the one who said that, you know, the table is the greatest, greatest piece of human technology ever created. And That's the first cool. time I met him, yeah, and, and the first time I met him, he pulled me your chat, he was like, hey, man. You know, sometimes people say, uh, keep it real. And I was like, yeah, bro. yeah, duh. He's like, do you keep it real? I'm like, yeah, bro, I keep it real. He's like, mm, yeah. don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 what you need to do is keep it surreal and surreal. just do things uh. a little bit beyond other people's imagination. Just mm. a little bit of surprise. This is not like rocket yeah. science. We don't need you to paint a Basquiat. We just need you to make this fun for us. Yeah. It's so great. You were sort of talking about really a key part of building friendships and relationships is being interested and curious. And I remember it sort of reminded me of my mother who said to me, not what did you learn in school today, but what questions did you ask? Mm. And so I was always the annoying kid in class. That, your mom <laughs> sounds brilliant, by the way. Who that's, asked that's all the funny. questions? I was a kid in medical school who sat in the front row and wouldn't leave till I understood everything and asked every question I had. And yeah. and I do that all the time because I I want to learn. You know, I think uh, I think I read it in your book. We have we have two ears and one mouth, and we should use them in that ratio. You know. Mm-hmm. And I I think that's exactly right. And I think that's how you build connection and community. Um, I want to but, but just but, but before you move on, when you say that quote, two ears, one mouth, totally agree. But you also have to use your mouth. You can't just yeah. use your ears only, right? And I would imagine that there are people in that class of yours who are like, "Man, Mark is annoying. Wish this guy annoying, would just shut for up." Sure, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'm sure that, but but I'm sure there were way, way, way more who were like, "Man, I'm so appreciative that Mark asked that yeah. question that I wouldn't have asked." that question yeah. that I wouldn't have thought of. And so now everybody else has a, a, yeah. a fuller knowledge of this topic, right? So yeah. that's the type of, I think that's why, you know, you come to Summit and your, you know, classmates who are boohooing about it probably are just, you know, doing some, uh, some boring work somewhere. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. And I think, uh, you know, the, um, the, the, the beauty of Summit, it's, it's so multidimensional. So you have these big events where you have thousands of people, you have small little weekend events where maybe there's a hundred people, um, mm-hmm. And then you, you created something called Summit Junto, which I recently joined, uh, which is really like a 
personal board of advisors in a way for yeah. your life, for your personal development, for business, for creation, for dreaming. Uh, and it's fascinating. I mean, people I would never have really either met or naturally collided with or even maybe even been interested in, but kind of unpacking each other's lives and sharing our collective stories and understanding, you know, where we can support each other. It's, it's just, a, it's really beautiful. So, I mean, it, it, there's, there's different layers where people can intersect with Summit. And I think it, it's such a beautiful creation that you've had where people can tap in wherever they, whatever they want. Um, I want to sort of jump to a, to a kind of a, a question about dreaming big, because mm -hmm. a lot of us are taught not to think about the crazy idea, to not think differently, to follow the status quo, to follow the rules, to do the things that we were conditioned to do. And I was having a conversation with a friend of mine last night about how we can reimagine the world where we, we kind of leave behind the things that don't work about our cultural norms and frameworks and ideas and conditioning that keep us from an authentic life, that keep us from having healthy love that keep us from actually being happy and and mm -hmm. our culture is so screwed up right now and, you know when you think about these indigenous cultures or these ancient communities like in sardinia or in okinawa or in ikaria or native american cultures or other indigenous cultures there's a fabric to those cultures there's rituals rites of passage there's connectivity but we've kind of lost mm -hmm. all that and, and so you know we we really kind of want to kind of reimagine and dream about a world that's quite different. And most of us are just not very good at that because we're told not to do that. Like, oh, don't be silly. Like, that's not going to work. Or like, I mean, I mean, if I, if someone, had, if I had said what I was going to say to the world about medicine uh, 30 years ago and gotten permission to, you know, have a crazy idea, which is that basically diseases don't exist and that our entire paradigm's wrong and that we're practicing 19th century medicine, that everything we think is right about how we treat disease is wrong. I mean, people laugh at me. <laughs> like they just laughed. They laughed at me. But I, I knew it was right, and I had to tell the mm -hmm. story. And it's what's driven me for thirty years. And and now it's finally like coming around. Uh, you know. Mm -hmm. And and how how do we get people to dream big like that and to to, to kind of let go of those societal norms and conditionings and uh, notions that that keep us limited? A big question. Um, I know. <laughs> It's, 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 I'd first say it's a luxury to get to think big, you know, like if, if the worst that can happen is you move back in with your parents, it's not that bad, yeah. you know, like there. So I think that to be born on the 50 or, you know, if you could field goal in from where you started, you know, you're <laughs> often in the position to really think big in those, you know, but, but what I'll say is that, uh, it's so hard to do by yourself. And yeah. I know plenty of people that have, and, 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 but, but, you know, the theme of this book and this interview really is community. And, you know, once you can build um, some shared interests and some, some care with one another, you don't have to rely on your own knowledge. You're, you know, a tree with deep roots. You can connect to each mm -hmm. other and you can keep each other accountable. You know, um, it's like going to the gym with a trainer versus going to the gym by yourself. It's like, you're not really there for him to show you, um, you know, the, the form it's really for the accountability. Um, so, uh, and, and I think that being really open to the idea that it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, once the search is in progress, something will be found, you know, like you will, if you lean into the thing, you'll find the right idea. You just can't yeah. be that attached to the specifics because those come later. Those come with the refinement and the, the deepening of knowledge around the thing that you're doing. Um, and so part of it is just like the bravery to jump, you know, like to be in a position to jump in the first place. It's hard to be creative when you're being chased by a tiger. So I yeah. think that, you know, I, I do believe that, you know, we have a pretty upside down society. You mentioned just like the wealth gap and the food gap and the education gap and sort of like, yeah. you know, the indentured servitude of student loans and, you know, like there's just so many aspects to this that are like unfair by design. Um, yeah. And so I do worry about that because it isn't for, you know, you, everybody doesn't just get to wake up in the morning and no. take a, take a moonshot. Uh, unequal, man, you playing, know? unequal playing field uh, for sure. A hundred percent. But if you are in that position, probably should, 
you know, because those are the things that actually change the quality of life for people around you. Not just in a direct sense, like you build a business, you have money, you can take care of your family. You can give to the causes that you care about the most. Like you don't have to convince other people to Mm. donate their money to do it. You know, like you can Mm. be direct, right? So, um, and then there's doing things that are just in general in service of humanity. So your work and your body of work and, uh, you know, us in a more indirect way, because we really support those that we think are making huge impact. We really do see ourselves as like a platform, you know, like we're, we're not as concerned with our own legacy. We're really concerned with our experience and the, and the experience of our children on this planet. And, uh, and I think that there's two, again, there's a big AB where it's like, if I only feel the quality of my own life, then I'm not going to be like globally generous. I, I happen mm-hmm. to feel, you know, um, that my quality of experience is attached to the suffering of others. And oh, it's self, sure. it's selfish selflessness, right? So yep. this idea that like it's puritanical or that like, you know, you, you, I don't know. I think a lot of us, I'm saying a lot of things at once here, but you're asking a really big question. <laughs> you know, like it's not about, it's not about wearing the baseball hat of the team or like looking the part. It's about doing the work and, mm. and it's not, it's not an identity. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's a commitment to, um, you know, wisdom. And if you're going to build, you know, I, I'll just end with this. Like if you're talking about big ideas, world changing, um, nobody does that in four years, man. You, you know, no player that's in the game for four or five years changes the world. Talk to me on year 20 in the game. You know, like you want to talk about wise men and women. They've been in this for a long time. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so that, that's, that's what I got for you, Mark. If you love that last video, you're going to love the next one. Check it out here. Living in fear, if you're living yes, in pain, the, the, the cell is not in a state to actually absorb anything. It's in a state of emergency. Yeah. In an emergency, there's no growth and repair. So, can you see I've seen person patients ha- like that who do I, 